cloud. All right, welcome to the March 21st Northwest San Pedro Neighborhood Council Port Environment Sustainability Committee meeting agenda. I'm going to begin with uh, our roll call. Um, we expect, uh, I'll go a little bit slow, so hopefully our member who's just here will be able to reboot. So let me get my attendance sheet. Uh, oh, okay, there we go. All right, so calling roll, the chair um, is here, Thomas Norman. Uh, see our vice chair is not returned. Pat Nave has an excused as absence. Craig Goldfarb, present. I want you to unmute. Here. Thank you. Jason Herring. Here. Okay, David Samperio. He'll be absent. Mary Chan. Here. Mary Yanian Chan. Okay, here. <laughs> yes, I'm here. And then our, our newest member appointed. Um, glad you got the Zoom link. Benjamin Norman. <laughs> Hello. Uh, here is your audio work here. 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 Hello. Okay. And, and then and then Gwen, Gwen Henry. Present. All right. So just mark one, one absent. And and we'll we'll note um I think David's made one meeting, but uh yeah, only the very first meeting. So uh as we're taking a minute, let's at least make sure we're capturing who's here and who's not here. All right, we'll now begin with uh, my announcement to students from the agenda. The agenda has been posted um, online and at the, uh, the police department. So if there are any students in the audience, if you please um, raise your hand uh, and I will note you for the attendance so you can get credit. Okay, doesn't look like those folks are students. So uh, we Finished our roll call. We'll go on to general public comment on non-agenda items. Remember that the time limit is two minutes. Is there anybody who would like to make a public comment? Okay, Richard Watson, your hand went up first. Please proceed. There we go. Uh, hi, thanks. Great to see you all. Um, I can only stay for a half hour today. I've got another uh, call to jump on. But I wanted to let you know what I'm up to. Um, I've, I've been listening to all the great ideas around improving uh, open space and green space and waterways here in the San Pedro area. Um, for those who don't know, I'm on the Coastal San Pedro Neighborhood Council. I'm the chair of the Sustainability Environment Committee there. And we, uh, we caucus uh, with the sustainability committees across the three San Pedro Neighborhood Councils, as well as you know um, uh, membership in the uh, coalition of Neighborhood count, uh, <coughs> Sustainability Committee, the NCSA, uh, which is uh, involves the sustainability committees of all the neighborhood councils that have one uh, in LA. Anyway, what I'm working on is really something along the lines of a master plan. Um, San Pedro uh, had done one five or eight years ago. I want to update that. And it really was identifying uh, parcels and opportunities to go and uh, upgrade the, the open space and green space in uh, the San Pedro city limits per se. And I wanna extend that out to include really the watershed of, I wanna say the Wilmington drain, um, but because of the Phillips um, petroleum oil field, I think that they've kind of artificially cut the, wa the natural watershed. So I wanna include the creek at the bottom of the community garden. And that watershed extends all the way up Capitol to East Lake Park where there has been uh, Heal the Bay uh, watershed management improvement, um, and really identify specifically opportunities to uh, to, to to address stormwater management, um, but uh, also really any uh, any any habitat restoration um, or improvement to open space, uh, green space, and water waterways uh, for community benefit. So, I want to invite you all to participate in that, and I'll be giving you more information uh, as it comes together in the coming weeks. You're on mute, Tom. Thank you very much. All right, is there anybody else who would like to speak for up to two minutes during the public comment? Okay, I'm checking panelists, checking attendees. Not seeing anyone wanted, wanting to be recognized. So we'll move on. Um, we didn't really have any action on the previous meeting. So 
uh, stakeholders, committee members, any comments uh, from you? Oh. You wanna be recognized, Gwen? Uh, this is for public comment? Uh, yeah, for the uh, item um, for the stakeholder comment, comments and suggestions. So go ahead. Uh, once again, uh, we're having the town hall on, or uh, Tim McOsker is going to have the town hall on uh, the 23rd, Thursday at Peck Park. So hopefully uh, everyone will attend. Um, Richard Watson, of course, uh, is also part of the community garden, as am I, and there will be some gardeners there um, uh, discussing some of the things that, you know, we talk about, but that would be a great, great place to put some of some of our concerns right up front. Um, also on April 8th, uh, there's going to be, Peck Park is having their extravaganza. And uh, so turns out um, I didn't get approvals for our pop-up, but I will be attending and supporting um, the literacy, um, Kiwani's literacy group. And hopefully all of you will also come. There should be, you know, it'll be a beautiful spring day and uh, the trails. Everybody should take a look at them. So, all right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Any other stakeholders' comments? All right. So, I, I have a comment, and as chair, it's important for me to discuss that our next meeting will be in person. Okay. That'll be my first time to do. Um, and any neighborhood council meeting in person, maybe I'd visited one in the past, but everyone was actively involved. So just a reminder to everybody in this committee, this is likely to be our last Zoom meeting. I have no idea if we'll be able to do hybrid as an option. What I've learned from just the overall neighborhood council listening is that as um, elected members or committee members, we're supposed to be in person. It's more if there's a hybrid option, it's for the public or community to have better access. So uh, I'm waiting for information. I guess what I'm Heard from our president, Ray, is once he figures out what they're doing for the overall group, then committee chairs will learn more about what our options are. Uh, my expectation is, though I know it's not everybody's favorite, um, I've only heard options in Peck Park Auditorium, which has some several issues. I know members of this committee have had issues that I'm sensitive to about uh, the acoustics and if that's the best. Um, so I, I'm not saying I'm favoring that, it's just the only one that I've heard. So if you have ideas, for me to investigate once that becomes my responsibility and you have connections or folks for me to copy, you know, or contact, um, I would, would appreciate that because I'd like to make sure we have as, as comfortable and as productive a venue as possible. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any suggestions on that, but the main point was to get on the record that, you know, be, be prepared. This will, will be very different in April. Uh, Gwen. Uh, so, so Peck Park doesn't ha just have the the actual auditorium, they also have rooms available, uh, smaller rooms, and uh, those have been utilized by different um, committees at different times. Generally, we've always always used the, the Beacon uh, City Hall, uh, which is very convenient, um, except for distance from our stakeholders. Um, but uh, the Peck Park rooms uh, are also an option. Once again, we will probably be extremely limited in that we won't be able to have an online presence during our meetings over there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not no, really I, sure about Beacon. Yeah, um, I, I but I would. Go ahead. Hmm. No, no, continue. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Thanks for raising that because, yeah, I, I am aware there may not even be connectivity there. That's one of the, the drawbacks. Jason. Uh, it's not like we have connectivity at Beacon. Um, we struggled with that for a very long time. We cannot use any of the networking systems they have in place. The city could not give us access for whatever bureaucratic or confusing yeah. reason. We tried for two years, probably. So I don't really see that being any different between the two venues. Um, the acoustic problems are with the building in general. It doesn't have any sound paneling or deadening. So it tends to be echoey in all the spaces of that building. There was talk and I heard of some money to upgrade some of those rooms. I'm not sure what the status of that is. There was rumors of it, but all you really need is some sound paneling to deaden some of that. And, you know, just like Wi-Fi would be great and you know, that'd be fantastic. But um, I don't think otherwise it's, it's probably a better option for our stakeholders. Certainly, well, it's a shorter drive for most people, I guess, on this committee. So um, those are the only options I know of. 
Uh, Mary, did you want to speak? Did you, does the library help can do to something like that? Mm, I think it's after hours. Okay. Yeah, and, and I haven't, you know, we, we do meet later, so I might have to poll about our 6.30 time. I think one of the constraints is if you go past a certain time at Peck Park, there's additional money, we'd have to get budgetary approval. So if, if we kept our meeting short, was it, somebody recall, was it after nine o'clock we got charged or after eight? I, I believe it was nine, nine so, o'clock. So, so that probably wouldn't affect us. We could probably do our business by nine. Um, so, so just, uh, you know, people's suggestions, um, you know, in particular, Craig has an opinion, I'm really, sensitive and, and Ben, you've had the experience of winning prizes and things right with basketball. So you know the auditorium and you know when little kids are running around or whatever, it was always kind of hard to hear. It was hard to hear when I went to the Peck Park uh, meetings after the shooting. Um, what you know, do you have any sense on or are you are you aware of a room in there? You've done a lot more activities there than I have. So I mean I know there's lots of rooms in there, but I know the auditorium definitely has some issues with the acoustics. Yeah. And if anybody else, if Craig, Craig wanted to weigh in, I was just, just trying to help to make a good decision uh, for folks. Okay, Gwen, you get your hand up again. Yeah, um, well, in, in regard, I'll, I'll check with, um, uh, sorry, I'm having a mind blank. He's running for office, actually. Um, Mike, um, over at uh, the director over at uh, Peck Park, um, so they, there is a computer lab room and there's supposed to be connections. There probably are hardline connections. Let me find out if that might be uh, usable, but there's a lot of desks and things like that. But once again, the rooms, there's, uh, they're all, so across from the office and the office door, um, you can go, there's little classrooms for um, after school childcare. Right. And then you turn over towards the bathrooms and, and actually we've had our own election in one of those rooms. Um, it's, it's in the hallway that, that is all the way down and to the right. Okay. And, and I will, I will go visit, um, you know, in the next week because our typical attendance is around 12. I think, you know, we might have rules. I don't, I don't know the rules and how many we have to have seating for, but I think acoustics would be better in a small room than the auditorium in particular. So if I, you know, found a, a spot where we could have 15 or so, I think that would be a good cushion. And if we we're seated across the table, hopefully that that we wouldn't have issues that those are my thoughts and continue to, to email me or call me if you have ideas i'd like to move on then to um discussion. did you want me to speak on this or oh, yes craig, you I asked did. me and yep. no i did i so, didn't see your hand go over here you please craig okay so one we've had meetings before at like restaurants because you can get rooms there usually um used to have our finance meetings at um, at a restaurant but the main room totally um, with the sound system we have and the lack of uh, proper care, that room, the gym room is, it's just unhearable. I, uh, I can't hear, I wasn't, even when my hearing was in the normal ranges, I wasn't able to hear very well with meetings there and it was, it's just a problem with that room. It's the hard walls. Um, there's nothing to soften the flow. I've heard that the guy who runs it. Now the smaller rooms, they're fine. I've been in all of them. Uh, and you know, the, there's, we could use, if they have them available, we could use all of them. I mean, we, we, we were at Beacon Street, but you also have the option of using the, the room at the police station. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure there's a few other places we could get rooms at. I mean, I, I'm surprised that um, the people from the board haven't ha spent the time and the effort uh, to find main venues, but that's just me. Anyways, go on, okay. I'm done. No, well, thank you. And yeah, please, please interject. If I go too fast, everyone. Okay, the second thing, this came to me from a member of the board, a, a discussion was forwarded to me about a letter some of our Northwest San Pedro residents were, were getting that was put in their mailbox. I guess it wasn't even delivered by mail, um, complaining about videotaping of their house before construction of the Clearwater Project. I don't know if there's anyone in the audience. Um, I, I know Melanie brought this to my attention and is not able to attend. 
but maybe there was going to be some in the audience that could give us a little more perspective or follow up. You know, basically what was relayed to me was that um, they wanted evidence of what your house looked like before they did the construction. There may be vibrations or things that could cause damage and um, they're asking for consent. So they would have proof to see if anything changed after the, the drilling. Um, and uh, that, you know, that's what I know. That seems different from meetings that I've attended as part of uh, the neighborhood council in, in terms of, I didn't, I don't remember them warning us that there could be settlement or issues affecting any of the homes in San Pedro. So does anybody have anything else to comment? I did say we would bring it up. And if, if uh, people know more, please share. Gwen? Um, I did go to uh, quite a few of the, um, the, the, the meetings uh, with the, uh, some of our um, in coastal and uh, we did have a, a large um, uh, presentation uh, within our own um, board meeting with uh, those guys. And uh, they assured that no one would uh, feel any vibrations. It's too far down and that kind of thing. Uh, but it does uh, show that the route for the tunneling um, starts to turn and goes towards the uh, the hill and towards White Palms into the drain and to a, another drain area that's right next to the current drain. So there is a turn where it starts to go under residences, and um, it is kind of interesting that they're they're um, they didn't say anything about having to check with households or anything like that. So, and they assured that nobody would feel any vibrations and to definitely call if you do, but they were, that was, that was one thing that a lot of people were concerned about okay. was that, that kind of activity. And has, any, has anybody received a letter or has anybody had a stakeholder come to them with the concern about this? You know, it seems to have affected two people that I'm aware of down by target. No. Okay. Well, we'll pro probably discuss this when we can have somebody, you know, I'm not going to save space. We don't have much more to say, but just to put that on our radar and in an alert. And then um, we wanted some discussion of the Phillips 66 interruption. I've had conversations with several people on this. And, um, you know, there's one specific idea I'll start with that we should invite the uh, AQMD to speak at our next meeting and provide community information on air reporting. Um, I don't know if I, I'll just go through all four and then Gwen, I'll recognize you to speak on whichever one, unless you want me to take them one at a time, but just introduce all the topics as you and I have spoken a few times. Um, an AQMD update on a new contractor, perhaps to monitor the uh, air monitors. We've discussed air quality several times this meeting, uh, discussed creating a community survey, asking about people's experience, getting a mapping of the area, and then discuss community air monitoring systems, which we have done before. So um, you asked for this to be uh, on the agenda, Gwen, so I'll recognize you to speak on it. All right, can you hear me? Did mm -hmm. I end you? Um, all right, so um, has everybody got a timeline as to uh, what was going on over there? That um, they're saying that it started uh, Saturday, February 25th, I believe, or 23rd. Uh, that was a new date. I've heard several dates from uh, different people and uh, 1230 AM on, on that Saturday, that February. Yes, the 25th uh, was a new one. Um, I've spo I spoke with, uh, we, you know, uh, as, as Melanie had already conveyed, um, she had had a direct line to Ken Dami and had been emailing and, mm -hmm. um, had the mobile uh, for him, but there was no response. And really, honestly, it was it was on Tuesday when I came down uh, the freeway and noticed tremendous flaring. You know, it, you could see it as a glow before you even saw the uh, the the refinery over there. So I I actually turned off on on Tuesday called Melanie to find out if she had gotten any of the emails. There's there's email alerts that are supposed to go out to the community that, that sign up for them, but she also was definitely on a group of people to definitely be alerted. Um, 
and the rest of it. And I said, have you received anything? Have you talked to Ken Dami? And she said, no, because she said that it, there had been flaring a couple of days in, in a row. So we were concerned. So we started to reach out at that point, um, nothing. Uh, so it was quite a bit of time when we find out that, that all power had gone out on, on the, um, the site. Uh, AQMD had been alerted uh, to go out there on different times, but they weren't told about the shutdown and they weren't, they didn't got no alerts until it was, I uh, gotta get the timeline again, but I believe it was um, late Sunday. It was, it was, it was 9.30, 9.30 p.m. on Sunday. And let me correct this. We were told by AQ uh, by by Philip sixty six that it started on Saturday, but actually, what they did in the board meeting was say that it started on Friday at twelve thirty a.m. That was the surprise. So it was two days before AQMD was alerted in any way. They had re uh, received no sensor alerts, and that's when Philip sixty six first reported to them. Uh, but they have been on site uh, based on different complaints from community members that you can you can send to them through the AQMD complaint. Um, uh, there's a there there's a form over there. You can also call it in. And uh, there are inspectors who are on twenty four seven to react to any complaints. So anyway. Uh, so there was an issue in, in trying to move into an action, action for the committee. Um, let's let's have discussion about the first idea. Is there support to invite the AQMD to talk if available April 11th? Is there anybody um, who doesn't want to do that? And, and no guarantee they'd be there. I guess I'd extend it to the May meeting if they weren't available April, but we want want to speak with them sooner rather than later. Craig. Yeah, what do you, I mean, I, air, AQMD does with air quality. Mm -hmm. um, and it's South Coast air, AQMD, it's not, a, <laughs> AQMD refers to the general. Yeah, so uh, South Coast. South Coast, yeah. I've had a lot of dealings with them in the past. Okay. Um, so I'm sure they have a, a person that will come out and talk to us, but I, I would think we'd want to get together very specific. They have nothing to do with the shutdown or, sh you know, or are they to be notified of shutdowns that I know of? They would be uh, going there, you know, because there's particulate matter, they see smoking um, and they have procedures on that, which is, things that we would probably want to know. Um, but in general, I mean, if I we would if we were going to invite somebody from AQMD down, I think we'd want to have make sure we're getting somebody that could answer the questions we wanted answered and that we had a specific set of questions to ask. Yeah, no, definitely if I have to invite somebody, they would want to know what they're speaking about. So I'm inferring that perhaps we would, you know, and this is where I need to be a little bit educated. They provide a lot of information on their website. So do we have an ask distinct from what is on their website, right? I don't want to say come show us your website, but uh, do we have a, can we make the ask more specific? One thing I was curious about is some people have been concerned if the power was out, how could Philip 66 have known the air quality was good? And I thought their response was they had backup monitors. So, um, and, and I don't know if the South Coast AQMD, you know, if they're monitoring, you know, would show anything or we could just talk about, you know, what does their data say? Um, or could they summarize there's something they know that we we can't easily determine as the public that would be useful? That would might make sense. Um, but but Gwen, I'll let you uh, recognize you next to see if you can help uh, tune this. I think Craig raises a really good point. Gwen? Well, first, uh, uh, to, so you know the workflow. Philip 66 must uh, write a report. They are in charge of their report. Um, They're going to cross the, the T's and dot the I's, but the report originates from them. South Coast AQMD cannot respond or, or do anything until Philip 66 does that report. Um, South Coast AQMD only is there when they have 
uh, they're, they're there when they get complaints or they get readings and alerts from the, the sensors, they go out there to see if there is a violation. Uh, the violation is that I believe it's a, if, uh, if, if any of the, um, the readings for Knox socks and, and one of like 26 different, different items, and we can all go to that website, by the way, and, and I, I, I'll be discussing this in a minute. Um, if any of them go off and go exceed the limits for that, that particular um, uh, toxin, I'll just say, uh, it, 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 se it sends an alert and um, immediately a, um, an inspector that lives in the area will be, be there to either read the air. Um, they have a mobile air unit um, or inspect and see if they can see any violations with that. Um, and then individuals who are in the area, if you see black smoke coming out of any of the stacks or black smoke coming from anywhere in, in a refinery or any other, um, any other of the, of the oil, you know, any of the other industries that are around here, please uh, contact them. That means, for example, with the stacks, and there are four stacks in four different areas um, of, of the, the facility, one just across from Target, Sorry, Home Depot. Apologies. Well, One up the hill. Could, could we try to focus instead of the, the whole right. detail? Okay. Of that? Well, uh, AQMD, AQMD the will only we ask. AQMD will only be able to um, provide information to the community how to um, to how to talk to them, what to report, give them the emergency, um, you know, give everybody the emergency numbers and and the ways to to um, report anything, and they can talk about what they do. So if there is a, a shutdown, when they come out and what their job is, but they will not be able to talk about this particular um, event specifically because Philip 66 must make that report before they can do that. So it'll okay. be in, informative only. Okay, so we can um, do that. Thank, thank you. And then yeah. Craig, did you wanna get back in your hands up? Yeah, okay. Well, a AQMD will um, oh well, AQMD. You know, it, they're constantly monitoring this stuff. They look for smoke. Um, I I know this because they've fined me uh, when I was in various facilities I managed where we had smoking. So they, it's not that they're not noticing. They know where everything is and where where it is, and they know the issues involved with it. Um, two, we really want to know about what their uh, policies are with oil refineries. So uh, I'm not understanding completely the, the shutdown on the refinery because all the refineries have backup power systems. So I know this has happened in the past, DWP has an interruption, they, you know, it's supposed to be an immediately pass over to that. So, you know, these are these are the questions we want to ask Philip 66, where was your emergency override? Because you can imagine if they lose power, um, if they had lost power completely, uh, I don't think all their systems would automatically go over because they would, a lot of things are actuated that way. I do have people I can, ask about that but um the the thing we need to really clarify is what are the rules that the refineries operate i mean when if i'm smoking i get fined do they get fined okay i mean sometimes they'll write me a, a notification but you know if it keeps happening um will do it and you know we, <coughs> You know, it's it's very specific information. I mean, they AQMD will react to certain things, and they can. And the thing we should be asking them is, how many fines have they issued? Because that is public information to the refinery. And I mean, we should ask the same about Valero because it's right mm -hmm. next to it. I mean, we're all uh, we're not questionable about downwind but um that's about those are the things that i would see because we need to have 
specific information and asking for specific okay and make sure they give us somebody that can answer those kind of questions so that that's helpful so let me capture uh ask about what other policies and refineries have any fines been issued we won't single one out we'll just ask you know for for both refineries and then it, it's probably appropriate just they could do a quick quick intro on what they do or you know their, their little presentation but we really want to focus it we've got specific information so we get the experts not just their community affairs person saying you see smoke call that would that would be useful okay um gwen yeah uh some preliminary information um when they were called out or when the uh when the sensors did alert that was an automatic fine. I do not know the amount or anything of that nature, but there, there were some alerts that, that did initiate from those sensors. Now on the site, you know, this is the concern is um, I, I've been going onto that site and I've looked at the, the sensors going back to January. And there, are, what's interesting is, is that, that for the most part, the, the sensors are very solid. You can see the lines of raising and lowering of, of levels and they're all within a limit. And there's a usually, there, for certain, for, for certain uh, uh, chemicals, they, you can see the bar of where the limit is. And if it raises over that bar and if it goes over a period of time, then it's going to send that alert. Um, you can see that, that in January, it's very consistent reading. Uh, but once the rains came, you, uh, there's a lot of breakages, a lot of gaps in those lines. And um, around the event of, of um, you know, starting on Friday, um, you can see some spikes. You can see some spikes and you can see actual areas where the lines stop. And when you, when you um, toggle onto the areas which discuss that particular time, um, what happens is, is it says it's missing or invalid. That data is missing or invalid. And there's large bars of that. And in fact, in the last week, um, benzene, we'll just take that for a moment. This is important to know, when you do go on that data site, change it to the five minute average. And what you'll see is, a progression uh, through the 24 hour day and you'll see the uh, you'll see the marks. If you do the one hour, you won't see what you need to see. You have to turn it to the five minute average. But uh, between March 16th and March 19th, good solid lines. And then um, it kind of reduces. And once again, these are these are sensors and you, there's a map there and you can see wh how what which direction the wind is is uh, blowing and which sensor it should be directing towards. But once you get to um, where the rains began again, there are breakages in the in the lines. And there's a lot of invalid zero points per billion and there is no zero points per billion for anything yeah um, so, so that's a, a good point Gwen so maybe we can add to this too if they could um um you know explain or let us know if there's other alternatives right so that you know it, it is concerning if at a time when we think there could be higher levels there is no data and this begs the question should we be inviting Philip 66 to address you know a question like that you know as well or you know, make this part of the South Coast AQMD, but but I, I do think it would be good if if Gwen, if you have you know some some data is what you know that you could actually present a report so we can actually look at that and say, hey, it's not just one, but there's you know multiple occasions over these periods of time where this looks odd because it fits in with some of our other concerns about should we have some other types of air monitoring, right? Maybe we can't rely on this one always. So you know, would our community air monitoring? I don't, it doesn't measure for most of these things we're looking at, but should, should there be some other system, right? Or are they doing enough to give us a reasonable sense of um, how safe the air is so people can take precautions? There, there's another issue for us as neighborhood council in this committee to possibly work on a letter, you know, just encouraging that, that even if they feel they don't have to, we really would like them to alert neighborhood council members of future events, right? So we can spread the word and, and people can make an informed decision to stay indoors or, or move outside the area should there be another um, you know, period of uh, excess emissions. So those are a couple action items. One, wanted to just 
look out to um, others who haven't spoken, just to give you a second if Jason, Mary, um, Ben, anybody in the community, anybody want to comment? I do want to comment. This is Mary. No, thank you, Mary. Don't we have an, um, like you were guys are saying, a third party system that can monitor, monitor this? Like, for example, Southern California has a Clean Act nonprofit that does air, air pollution. I'm not sure that's is part of that, that can fit in here. That's what I'm asking. Okay, kind of does, everybody. Does anyone know? Um, I Mary? have an answer to that. I have an answer to that. Um, I actually reached out. Uh, one of the main organizations is uh, Keck USC. Um, they have a, an, a very long-term, decades-long um, study that actually utilizes um, air monitors in the area in correlation with uh, the health of children who have been raised in the area and the general health of people all through these areas where um, there is refining and other industries that impact um, the communities that direct, live directly nearby. Um, what it is, is uh, they're reliant on sensors working. And now the Clean Air Action Plan, for example, there, there was a requirement uh, for sensors to be placed around the port, um, sensors around the refineries. And each one of these entities is responsible for uh, the upkeep of those, those sensors. If they go down, um, it's... It's reliant on the community and, and on uh, the organizations to alert them and say, please maintain them. And that's been a, a point of, of difficulty over probably as long as I have been active with and attentive to the, the problem. It's been the last seven years. Um, uh, Andrea Hricko, who uh, is one of the leads at Keck USC, uh, the first time I ever noticed her was at the big announcement of the Clean Air Action Plan uh, back in 2016, I believe it was, uh, Long Beach. And uh, Eric Garcetti was there and, and the commissioners of Long Beach and, and LA were there, big announcement. But Andrea was very specifically saying, and she had a big stack of documents saying that the the, the sensors around the port are not working, that they too have zero points per billion and points per million uh, as co consistent readings. And those readings are being utilized and, and added, and they've actually added those, those zero readings to the averages when they talk about that they've made drastic improvements, hooray, uh, over the air quality around the port and that they've already made these advances, but she alerted that the air sensors around them, around there, the ones that were invalid, that were not reading anything, and that's an indication, a zero reading means that it's not reading air at all. There's, uh, there is always some kind of reading in air, even if you're on the top of Mount Everest, on a clear day, there's a reading. So, so to yeah. try to move that into an action, then do you have a contact from Keck? Maybe should we could we invite I, from Keck to talk about that, and we could invite the professor who talked about his, you know, the the kind of consumer air monitors or the the little ones we thought about doing. He does research in this too. Maybe we could have an expert look at the data because I know what I've been trained as a PhD is missing data has to be treated as missing data. You can't throw it into zeros or you'll you know, you'll be, your reputation will be ruined, right? Because that's misleading. It's not a zero, it's an unknown number. So. Well, let me, let me get you a response. I did do an, uh, a quick reach out. Um, let me, let me find that, that email. It was very preliminary. Um, but Edward Aval, who is also uh, part of this. Um, let's see. Edward is the person at Keck? He's he's uh, the other person. Yes, yes. He's the uh, he's actually. Uh, let's see. Um, there is a lot of missing data. If the intent is that there are non-detects, 
uh, but that the instruments are working, then there should be some lower or minimal level or detection shown, which would be different than zero. Um, he's being very careful with his wording, of course. Um, but uh, with that, um, and also the fact that AQMD inspectors were not informed of refinery issues or did not respond to them. And he, they, their, their first time that they went out was Sunday, February 26th. Um, uh, but, but didn't you say it happened on the 25th? So that's that's only a one day. That, no. Yeah, well, well, that was the that was the first it, a twenty four hour period. It was over twenty four hours because it was uh, it was actually from the report was that it started the 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 initial report from Philip sixty six was it started on Saturday at two a.m. and and AQMD says that they they first were contacted and first were out Sunday nine p.m. So that's already. We're, we're, we're getting into over 24 hours, not, not 48, but you know, 36. But on top of that, at the board meeting, they were clear to say that it started Friday, Friday the 24th at 1230 in the morning. Um, that's, that's what it says on the recording. I was a little surprised about that. So that's, that's actually over 48 hours before, if that is true. You know, they, they could have given the wrong date. Um, but but anyway, even if it's on Friday, February 24th, uh, Edward Aval says it's troubling. He doesn't know what the protocol is re uh, regarding reporting requirements but and allowable lag times, but he believes, as far as he's concerned, one and a half days seems to be too long for the AQMD to be brought out. Okay. Um, so. All right, so we, we've got a oh, lot. I'll send of, this email. We, we've got a lot of lot of background. Is mm -hmm. there anybody opposed to an invitation to somebody from the South Coast AQMD to talk to us at our next meeting? Okay, so we've had discussion, um, and uh, we can also ask them for information on the new contractor um, on here. Uh, Gwen, can you give more uh, perspective on the the third request, a community survey? Uh, to get experience. So were you thinking of a like a survey monkey or how, how could this committee perhaps do a survey uh, in line with your your recommendation? Well, um, of course, it would have to be board approved. This is getting into a lot a long time after the event. But um, I would hope that we would be able to ask some simple questions, which is also which it would also lead them to be informed of the South Coast AQMD, the AQMD uh, emergency number and the email. But asking them, did they, you know, where do they live in the community? Did they did they notice or any any event at or around Phillips 66 that they noticed and might have given them some concern. Uh, what was that? Um, do they remember the date? Can they do a description? Where were they um, at the time? You know when they noticed this, and go from there. So um, it would be, I, I think that we should have because we've already heard reports of seeing flares. Um, smelling chemicals, um, hearing noises, um, taking video, taking photographs. So those all, all those things, um, and giving a time, a place, and and a, and a brief description of what what their experience was. That all of those things uh, should be in this questionnaire. Oh, and including some of the other South Coast AQMD asks things like, "Did you see black smoke? Were the flare, were the uh, the stacks on a full flame, or was there less of a flame? Did they see, yeah, black smoke or opaque okay. stuff coming out of it? Any of those things? So, so, so make a survey being... like that, but also say, did you contact the South Coast AQMD at this number and at at this Okay, so we're, we're at about 12 questions, so kind of at least a medium length survey. Is there interest in the committee to prepare a survey? I'm not prepared to, you know, we can't bring it before the board unless we have the survey for them to vote on that have to have that. So is there, um, is there interest in doing this? Um, keeping in mind, it would be about 
you know, it'd be weeks before we would get that out. Um, and the event is in the past. So is there anybody in support of the idea of working with Gwen on a survey? I'll I'll just go ahead and throw one together. Um, okay. uh, are we able to do one on Survey Monkey without a fee? I, I have a Survey Monkey account, a Qualtrics, so I, I can you know use my resources to host a survey if we have the questions and we get them approved through the proper channel. So I'm happy to do that, and okay. you know, I'm happy to give advice on a survey. Um, it sounds like you know the the questions are typically asked. So you know my recommendation to survey design is if there's already an AQMD one, you know make it as close to that and the the items so they're comparable. Right. Right? So you can compare it. Um, is there anybody opposed to doing a survey and you know does not want going to undertake that? Okay, so I don't see any opposition. So I'd encourage you to to work on the survey, and um, I'm happy to consult. And then do we want to discuss the community air monitor systems um, any more at this point or? Are, are we going to think about that and maybe come prepared at the next meeting to build it in, given what we're going to learn from South Coast AQMD, possibly others? I only yeah. have one. I had only one thing um, with reaching out to Ed and Andrea. Um, I wanted to find out there has been a a lot of technology advancements. Um, for example, Porter Ranch benefited very well, much from a um, uh, a visual, an infrared uh, type camera, where you could see methane and other invisible gases as it poured out. Um, I'm sure that, I, I know that in Texas, uh, that technology has been used by a lot of organizations at this point, and they, they have a lot of those cameras available that action groups and other study groups and journalists are now using. So. Um, I'll try to find out if there's any additional technology, maybe, you know, one portable one or something, you know, well, just find out more information. And for, for us to buy or, you know, just because it exists, what we recommend uh, to buy it or? To find out the pricing and, and what is available out there. And uh, if, if, you know, if a group might be able to get the funds for that and be able to use utilize that particular technology. Okay, and, and there, yeah, there are the port grants coming, you know, so I guess there are some funding. Let me ask Ben Norman, I know you go to a pretty advanced science um, school where when I look at the projects that students do, they, they've monitored the ocean I've read, I've seen you guys splicing DNA and stuff. I don't, I know you're not in the environmental class, but can you do some research to see if they have this infrared or if anybody's working on a project like this that might be interested in work, working on the harbor? What do you mean slicing DNA? We don't do that. Well, I don't know. You, you do all kinds of things. I don't even understand what you guys do. When I, when I go to your <laughs> school, I, mean, uh, uh, I don't think we have any of that stuff you're talking about. The only equipment we really have is um, is pipettes. We have an autoclave, but that has nothing to do with this. Yeah, well, no, but how about on the environment? Is there anybody doing research? Because I've, I've read as an interviewer for college, some environmental projects dealing with water quality. So if, if you could just do some research and see anything that you've, you've heard, if there's students doing projects, that would be good for us to know about. Oh, I think, well, I think, do, I think the, the class is doing something with the water quality right now. Okay, so if anybody's doing anything with air quality in particular, that, you know, that would be good. And I know you've got a science fair coming up, so I'll I could ask some of them in my engineering class because there's a ton of them. There might be a master's student or are there, is there a master's program by any chance? Oh, no, he's just in a high school, but they, they do oh. some. Oh, wow. And I, and yeah. I will reach out to our environmental science professors. We have our Senate meeting tomorrow and uh, it'll, it's raining, so I might not, my, people might not show up to socialize, but I'd like to see if anybody's doing any research because we did have the person who presented in the fall who was looking at indoor, uh, outdoor air quality. And, um, you know, see if there's anything that, that the university might have or anybody is already doing some analysis. I know I've attended presentations on the correlation between test scores in Wilmington and their quality. So that's probably uh, probably done in conjunction with some of the people you've mentioned at CAC. So so I'll, I'll, I'll put that on myself to do a little more research. Craig. Yeah, one of, one of my concerns about these monitors, like the one, one we were doing is it just many measured particulates. Now, just to address the thing, like you're not going to get any air measurements when it's raining. 
-hmm. It's just, you know, the rain's washing everything out. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the, the things that concern me, which are, which are main, main pollutants, uh, are VOCs, um, SOX, and NOx. Um, and most of the monitors I've seen that are like, like the ones we were looking at didn't even address that. All they addressed it was particulates. Mm -hmm. uh, while particulates are a concern, um, I'd be, especially with it raining like this, I'd be concerned if there was a lot of, if during that release, there was a lot of socks because that turned, it's, it's uh, that turns into sulfuric acid. Um, NOx is, is another, you know, just a greenhouse gas. Um, there, there's other things, but the, the main portion of this that concerns me is not only do we have monitors, but, and we've known like the ones around the port weren't maintained, not only are they not maintained, but how often are they being calibrated so we're getting accurate information? So, I mean, it's, we, we, you know, addressing the issue is, is getting, is much more complex than just uh, a simple thing. You know, it, we need to make sure that A, that they, these systems are being maintained and calibrated and are reporting accurately. Otherwise, and this, you know, anybody can see smoking. The rest of the stuff, NOx and SOx are pretty much, you don't see them, uh, uh, or VOCs. I mean, and, you know, just because it's around the port or it's around, um, how do you put it, the refinery, the, the thing I was, I was looking at other data previously on stuff that was doing on the Culver City, um, um, it, where they have all the, not the refinery, it's um, where they do a lot of oil oil pumping and all that. Um, a lot of the, the interesting thing was there was a, they were catching a lot of um, data from outside their area. So it wasn't that it was coming from what their activities were, but they were catching like from metal, metal, metal reworking of metal um, you get chromium and, and cadmium, and they were catching a lot of that in their in their information. And those are things that w these things aren't pointed towards, but affect us. So uh, these are the things that you see in Paramount, where they have a lot of the uh, metal recycling facilities. Uh, so I mean, th those are things we need to do, and that those are things we need to to look at and we need to be educated on what, where the limitations on these things are um, for ourselves. So impossible, uh, you know, if we're gonna get somebody to speak, um, maybe we could get put together a sesh, an inform information section mm -hmm. other than this, uh, that we could sit down with somebody and find out this kind of information because otherwise okay. we're just you know we're having to dig into it and uh without a lot of background no I, I think that's good so i've added to my notes and requests you know i do think we have a concern in the community are the monitors being maintained you know there's evidence that there's not and are they being calibrated right so can we believe the data you know can do, and we do believe they're doing what they should be doing for the community to have good data um and and point taken on the other materials coming from other areas. It's it's still just good to know what's in the air we're breathing. Gwen? Well, everything that, that Craig just mentioned about the calibration, that has been an ongoing discussion. And even the the uh, people doing the studies at Keck, that's that's been their mantra. Okay. Um, and it's it's absolutely true. And that's you know, our our initial discussions were based on the fact and that even during this clean air action plan and this this was one of the topics one of the four discussion points the aqmd is supposed to have uh sensors they're obligated to have some as well and in fact there's one over on berrywood 
uh, that is not working. It's never worked because they don't have Wi-Fi. And uh, it is also a known and quantified thing. And then once again, Andrea Rico at the last Clean Air Action Plan update, uh, Pat and I were there. Um, she, she drilled the AQMD on that the, the sensors are not working, what's going on? And they said uh, they are seeking out another contractor. And that's, that's a question that we can actually um, reach out to the, the AQMD to find out where they are on that process because it's been months. And they, they were seeking another contractor in order to take over the air quality sensors because they know that it's been severely lacking. All right. So um, and now, now with, with that point about uh, hydrogen sulfide, um, I, I'm taking pictures of all of these before they disappear. There's a 90 day period before these readings disappear, these easy to see uh, readings, but hydrogen sulfide did spike on March 4th. And it was during a time, I mean, it, it's kind of a surprising uh, lift. And once again, I do not know what the numbers are, but at 177 points per billion, and when you see on a graph that has a limited amount of range, um, it's way up there. Um, and at the time, it was at a moment when the, when the winds, and once again, what you were saying, Craig, if it's raining, if the wind is in the wrong direction, it's not going to hit one of those four sensors. It's kind of a potluck. If there's a strong wind and it's going past all of the sensors, uh, there's not gonna be a reading. But this particular spike did happen when the, when the wind shifted for that moment directly to a sensor, and then it started to move away. There's one particular day that I saw a particular reading. I've got to take screenshots and it's an amazing amount of screenshots because there's no less than, uh, it's seriously oh, yeah. 18 so, so different things. So, so it'd be better to see the data yeah. than hear you know, reactions to, to data. Yeah. So we understand there's a concern. So I'd like to, a, yeah. to, to move from this. We've got an action to take. So we'll, we'll yeah. see if we get a yes um, you know, for our dates and time in, in whatever location we're going to be in. Um, and then is there anybody, um, I was asked to put discussion of the Phillips 66 notice for preparation for an EAR to support their application for the for a 40 year lease. It's a pretty long lease, um, which uh, I understand is necessary for financing, right? They want some security, they're going to be there. There was a, a meeting I wasn't able to attend. So if somebody was able to go to the public Zoom on March 14th, would like to hear you know, a synopsis of the main points there and then to see if there's anybody interested in, in working on a letter um, from this committee, or if anybody has anything for this committee to review, given we would have to comment by April 10th. Um, that's not, that's going to, um, there's not gonna be enough time for us unless we have a letter ready to present that unless we have another special meeting. So uh, first off, is there anybody who wants to share? Uh, Gwen, is your hand up for that? Uh, unfortunately, Pat was more informed on this, but, uh, but with that, um, if I recall, um, they are obligated to have an EIR and, um, I, I'm, he's, he's on holiday this whole time. I don't know what we can do. Um, well, there's there's other members of the committee, but, so um, you can look to Mary or Jason or Craig. I know Ben, you're just starting, but um, and there, I don't know if there's anything going on at Coastal. I think we lost. Uh, um, we could, could follow up sometimes. The Joint Committee uh, works on things. So, uh, Jason, anything that you've got or any suggestions? Well, I mean, in general, with this topic, uh, it's you know this, this self policing of you know of the refineries. It's common throughout the industry where they self-police and there's no penalty for not doing it, right? So right. Where, where's the enforcement of these? These sensors are required by law, but there's no penalty or enforcement. They're not motivated at all to maintain them, keep them calibrated. You know, they're just not. And clearly, if a slight change of the wind can spike and then turn it off immediately when the wind changes, uh, there's not enough sensors, right? So these are all things that should be taken into account when we talk to some sort of um, you know, authority that could perhaps put these things in place as 
with penalties involved. Like if that sensor goes offline and it's down for like six hours, what's the penalty for? Right. I mean, you know, we can sit here and and put up, I mean, my little purple air sensor works great, but you know, that picks up PM, but it's not picking up VOCs as mentioned, things like this. So, you know, and and what's, you know, I can raise my hand and say, oh, the air's bad, but who's gonna listen, right? They, if there's not some sort of enforcement regime and penalty regime, that we can talk about this for hours and hours and nothing will happen. It'll be completely meaningless because they're motivated to have non-functional sensors. They're motivated to see those zeros across the board, right? So. First, we need some sort of enforcement regime to actually work, and then maybe we could put in better rules. And there's nothing right now. So. And, and, and thank you for that. Uh, Craig, you um, came visible. Did you want to comment? Uh, I was commenting on the other issue, which was- The letter? Uh, the, 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 you know, first of all, we, we had made comments on it, but the lease is, is a 20 year lease with an option. Two 10 years options on it, mm -hmm. which I can understand with the money. I think, you know, I, I've gone through this, and uh, one of the things uh, Pat fails to realize is before you can do any construction, you have to go through a process. And one of them is testing. So if they have to, if they're going to do, you know, if the soil is, is contaminated, they have to test it and remediate it before they could do anything. This is before sale or anything else. This is what, uh, you know, re required by the city. Uh, so it's, that doesn't concern me as much as long as we're, we're following the process and seeing that they're doing it. But I, other than that, I, I, you know, we've already commented on this matter. It's, and, um, you know, I, I can see why they want a 40, they're going to be spending millions. Uh, I don't, I didn't see the figure, but it, it looked like at least a $10 million project. And uh, it, it's required by modem. So, uh, you know, uh, be that as it is, uh, I'm, I don't know. I don't see a reason for commenting more, but you know, that, that's just me. Okay, and and I will note, I one thing that I feel, you know, pleased about is if they have been operating under this month-to-month -month lease for decades, they're now going to be having to go through this process, which is I think in line with what we've, you know, asked for to ensure they're 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 um, mitigating and taking actions. And yeah, I do know from my commercial banking days, right? I understand why they'd be asking for um some security, right? You need a time to amortize all the costs they're going to put off. So I'm not seeing anybody want you know with a letter anything more that we need to do unless Gwen you've got your hand up no nothing new nothing more to add to this particular thing we yes we have already um communicated sent them our comments but uh but with this let's just uh let me just see if anybody else can clarify so so the really the drive is not just to um, increase the safety, you know, finally be under uh, under a lot of um, uh, requirements and and regulations, but uh, is this also going to increase the the volume of export um, out to the the market? Is this going to increase the volume of that the re, the refinery is going to uh, be producing um, because with that uh, we have once again to consider the safety of the refinery itself, these air monitors, and that kind of thing. So if if the idea is to get more product out there, um, then you know this is a this is a, an infrastructure that um, seems to be lacking. We have a lot of concerns about. Um, this one um, actually, you know, people smelled rotten eggs and the rest of it. And uh, uh, there, there's a health concern with two people. Mm -hmm. But um, so once again, it's our neighbor and should we, we should have good neighbors. Um, also, if, if everybody might take a look at the hillside itself, um, they do have a, a lot of asphalt over that hill to try to, I, you know, keep erosion down, I would assume. But, um, you know, 
I've passed by on a few days and, and there seems to be areas that in the rain have crumbled. If anybody wants to go out there, take look, take pictures of it and uh, see what they see, um, you know, yeah. because that's an ongoing issue. It's yeah. been an ongoing issue with uh, erosion. And, and and it up. Is that impacting the community? Is that on their land? Or I, I don't understand the, um, the, yeah. the erosion. Is that blowing into other people's land or adding particulates? Or what's the concern about the... Well, the concern is, is you know, the pumpkin tank? How, how many, you know, how heavy is the, the pumpkin tank? The tank that's usually, you know, Halloween pumpkin. Uh, it's sitting on a hill. And so there's a slope. And you see asphalt. And that asphalt uh, regularly crumbles, and there's a big eroded area out of that. So there's a whole big chunk where the earth has come down and collapsed. And you can see cracks and things like that all the way around. So how sound is it for the, all of that infrastructure that's at the top of the hill that is uh -huh. very heavy? Okay, that could, it's the that stability could of that hillside. Is it, you know, is it? Um, solid rock or is it sand <laughs> you know that kind of okay. thing okay well thank you um all right well i don't see any action then to take on d so uh, we'll move on to e and, and this came from gwen um under our review pass current motions bills um you wanted to talk about the goat vegetation mitigation for the la city um that there was a motion passed in 2021 that's going to expire june 2nd of 2023 I, I, I made an error. Um, you know, both of them present themselves as uh, plans for mitigation of for wildfires. And whenever they use that term, uh, you think that they're they're trying to mitigate vegetation or make plans to keep fire, fire uh, fires from happening. But really what it is, it's all planning and land use. It's all zoning. It's about it's about uh, um, uh, properties and and how close they can get to some of that some of those wilder areas such as you know for peck park you know there's there's a a wall a fence right there and then there's there's some weeds and then there's a trail uh, that was a concern that's just a small example but the the urban wildland interface um there's the, the those motions are more about um, how close you can build, whether we we should allow more development right up against certain parklands and things like that, and and building codes. That's all it really is. Um, I'm trying to find anything that talks about um, the the requirements of Rec and Park, um, and to make keep spaces maintained. Um, anything along those lines, uh, funding of weed abatement or anything of that nature or, or funding of uh, ensuring that areas stay natural and don't get choked up and like it has in Tech Park. I, anything along those lines, I'm trying to find something, but haven't found it yet. Okay, and, and if people have looked at the links, I see some neighborhood councils have you know, opposed this uh, measure because it could make housing yeah. higher, and so, so um, yeah. So I wasn't sure what, what, what actually wanted to take other than bring that. But, so, so you don't want to discuss those? Should we move on to? Yeah, that, but, but, but there is one thing: the Senate bill, uh, which I don't see the link for in here. Um, that was actually the the important one was the Senate bill. Um, the there is a statewide push to allow. Uh, goats and that kind of thing to be able to come through and graze their way through a, an open space, which has uh, proved to be very, very effective. So they really want to put this in as a program for uh, areas such as Peck Park. It would be very beneficial. A lot of us have talked about it for a long time in the state. State bill would be a good, good beginning. Okay. Ray Patricio rides again. For those of you who don't know, Ray was always pushing goats in the park and in other areas and i don't know. used to have goats over at the the cemetery so they have it at rpv rpv uses them i've seen them uh, i've seen them in uh um god i 
I've driven all the way to Azusa and I, I see them everywhere. So you know what the pushback right. was, right? Why we don't have those? Because the city attorney um, was worried about the electric fencing that has to be used because it can provide a mild shock and they didn't want liability. Mm. Interesting. Okay. They, they came up with several excuses. One was about, uh, you know, the feces and it, it's it's been interesting but uh, you know it's it's there hasn't been on the other side a real interest in it but maybe with other other sides pushing it because i mean it was a real ray would bring it up all the time and it was really uh and it was just like he got his name of of goat goat man and for at least four or five years at, with peck park deaf ears, but we did get this mm -hmm. the park uh, administrator has been a little more open to the idea, uh, but it's too late for this year. So we were going to try to push it again for next year. Now with this state bill, uh, I think we'll have a lot more possibility of success. So I'm optimistic for next year. Okay. That'd be nice. I mean, maybe we could put, put a little addendum onto the, the trails named after Ray about the goat. So. <laughs> sure. All right. So. I, 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 Ray was really funny about this stuff. So I mean, <laughs> so I, I didn't know that history. I appreciate knowing the GOAT history. So, so in general, I'm hearing people are okay with the idea of GOATs. There's a Senate bill. Does anybody want to write a letter in support of the Senate bill? Or we just discussed it and people look at our recording. They'll know we, we have interest in GOATs back in Peck Park. Well, the bill's there. I think we just need to get a yeah. letter to the city attorney or to the parks and say, look, Senate bill says this. Let's do this. Let's just let's get that going. Oh, okay, so so the bill. I'm sorry that I didn't get it on the agenda. Then, Gwen, if you sent it, so the the bill did pass, and so we. Or, no, or, it hasn't passed yet. It's still it's still going through. I I sent okay. the sent the leak. It's still it's still moving through, but um, it's got it's got good. Okay. It, it's it's not it's not one of those sleepers. You know, it's you know there there's thousands of bills that get thrown out there, and you know uh, only you if you you give me the 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 link to the bill, the, sure. the number on the bill, I'll write a letter, sure. uh, I owe Ray. So, okay. awesome. Well, thank you, thank you, Greg, that'll be wonderful. Um, because yeah, they, I think it's around May that things get finalized, right? So it'd be time to, to weigh in on that, and of course. Um, and I apologize for the typo, I guess. Uh, maybe that's what happened. It looks like there's a six, so maybe that somehow yeah, I- Yeah, I got it got a little mixed up on there. That's all um, right. But but you want to discuss the sale of Rancho LPG, and you gave us a, a link to look at that. Um, for those not familiar, so you might look at the LA Times uh, article that's in the link there. And uh, again, Gwen, you gave me a lot of things. So if you want to discuss why that's on the agenda and, and what, what we might do about it. Well, that, that keeps coming up, you know, uh, uh, it was in uh, April of 2021 when when it, it became apparent that uh, there was that that the Rancho LPG or whatever it's called now, Plains United or whatever it is, um, uh, uh, put it back up for sale. And uh, Joe Buscaino actually had a dialogue with uh, them to talk about, hey, you know, we would love to support a, a um, business in the area that would be, you know, be better for that than, than what its current use is. I don't know. He, it, it, it was a kind of a vague letter. But um, the sale itself was out there and just need some kind of follow through to find out if, it, you know, if it's still up for sale or if they've given that up. Because uh, here we are, it's 2023 now. So in terms of to ask, would the committee like me to like reach out to council member McCoster's office and see if he knows what's going on with that or if there's that any follow up from us? Okay, so yeah. I'm, I'm happy to check in with, with Tim staff on that. Um, and then might be similar for this one. So you had um, community issues update regarding the Navy supply fuel point. Yeah. If anything's changed with the administration change. And so would you want me to put in a request to the, the council member on that one too, or is there somebody else? That one, that one actually uh, 
community issues. Um, actually, oh, it was a oh, reach out to community issues. issues. Yeah, they, the they community issues kind committee. of point on that. Uh, I forget the gentleman's name. His last name was Smith, I believe. Um, he he's with uh, the Navy, and they've kept us relatively informed through it. Um, there's very they're very it's very limited what they can say about it, but they were looking at somebody, I believe, and uh, there was a bid. Uh, once again, I, I'm I'm going to backtrack on that, but uh, to find out if there is any updates. Okay, and that yeah. is from 2019. So are, are you you talk? This is being handled in um, committee. Issues issues. committee. Yeah. So, well, then, I mean, we can let, leave it to them, right? I, we shouldn't cross over too much with that. No, just I to find to out. Comment on Rancho, because the problem with Rancho is it's it's playing to it's being it's the reservoir for two uh, refineries. I believe it was Valero and yeah. BP. So the the issue comes in if they close those down which concerns me even more is how they're going to have to get rid of the butane one way or the other. So how are they going to get rid of it? This is, this came in, they closed down the pipeline between the refine, between the tanks and the port. So all of it was going out through the pipes and going, most of it was going out through the pipeline and onto a ship. Mm -hmm. Okay. These brilliant people that, uh, uh, some of which we know thought, oh, if we close that down, we will close down uh, Rancho, which definitely didn't happen. Um, and in fact, it made the situation even more dangerous because now everything's going out by train and by rail, by by rail and by car, and then it's even a more dangerous situation because we see you know, what happens when uh, rail cars go out and we see what happens. We've seen, you know, truck accidents. So, um, you know, some the, the problem with doing stuff like that is it's, it's, it's the height of nimbyism. It's, oh, get it out of my backyard. I don't care who else we endanger. And it's even more dangerous, not even for our community, but for communities like Wilmington, and Carson, who have to, who have that all that traffic going through it. So, um, I it's one of the things that we be, need to be aware of if these things happen. I can't see um, those tanks going away, but if they do, um, and I and I have asked people that are affiliated with this stuff where. What happened? Um, why don't they have the tanks on their own facilities? And it's because of our regulatory re regimen. It makes it almost impossible to build, put in these things. Uh, if you, you know, we so we need to look at it at as just as not just as getting this out of our community, but that we're not negatively impacting other communities. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Okay, so that's just, you know, kind of getting updates and finding out what, if there are any plans for those. Well, I'll see if I can bring back information. On number six, you had the San Pedro Community Garden. What? Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, all of the, all of these storms here. Uh, let, let me explain to you a couple of things. So, uh, much like essay recycling, uh, which has to have a filtration system. Uh, all of the runoff from there, it goes into um, into a whole filtration system before that water can be expelled off the site, any storm water. Um, that's true of the Department of Sanitation um, site up there with all of those trucks. There's a lot of oil and um, coolants and they leak a lot of things and there are requirements to have drains up there that also take all of the uh, the storm water flow it so it gets some type of filtration and there is a fairly stringent filtration that's supposed to be on there there's only one problem the rain does not flow towards that drain there is a drain there 
but uh, the vast majority of the water flows directly downhill to a place where there really isn't a drain and no system. And it pools up there and it also uh, goes into this community garden that has sprung up around it. Um, so I had been monitoring with, it, so it's been a year's worth of uh, the community garden actually working with the, with the Department of Sanitation. They actually are very motivated to solve that now that it's been really brought up to them because it is a requirement. This is a, a legal requirement of theirs to ensure that, that the site um, all that motor oil and everything does not end up in the, the stream down below the, the waterway. There's a, there's a channel right there. It does end up in that channel and go out to the harbor. There it's, then there's, there's some other flow areas. Um, it's a requirement of theirs. And so they are motivated, but they aren't motivated fast enough. And this, this last storm, not only I, did I record how the, oil and everything had pooled up, but for uh, in a, one particular area behind uh, these, these green bins, it was moving down a pathway and into somebody's garden plot. And they had, uh, mm. they had dug, you know, ho uh, hoed out rows. And you could see the, the, the area where it flowed, it was a black, it was coated with black. Um, it was that toxic okay. and going into those, those rows and you could see the black oil and gunk going right in there. So, and you can, you can take a look at it now they were supposed to have blocked it off and done a few things to mitigate that. What they did is they put some, some, um, tubes filled with straw, which, did not last more than two seconds. And, you know, so I'm taking pictures of basically motor oil and everything else just kind of seeping everywhere. Um, with these rains, it, uh, it's also because it's flowing in the wrong direction. Uh, part of the uh, rain garden has actually collapsed. Um, it's, there was a landslide. So um, the, it's actually impacting the stability of that hill. And it's coming closer and closer to the actual yard itself. If they want that Department of Sanitation site to continue, they have to work on it. So they are bringing in some engineers to look at that. Okay. So but, the, but the speed, it's not so great. But the other issue that's going on over there is that um, many of the seniors that originally were there, they, the water is no longer for free. It shouldn't be, but it uh, it used to be when when it was plentiful. Now it's billed. A lot of seniors can't afford it. They're being priced out. Um, Can you explain that? So you're telling me at the community garden, if you want to do the garden, that you have a spot and then the water is metered out and you get a bill for the water in your garden? Yes. Uh, for It originally uh, sprung up spontaneously at a time when water was plentiful. And it was like, hey, can we garden on this area of your hill? Yeah, sure, no problem. And they did. So after a while, water became more of a precious resource. And the Depart Department of Sanitation is trying to find $150,000 you know, water bills from this thing. So, so the city was like, no, 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 we can't do that. So at great expense, Joe Buscaino uh, helped, uh, helped to um, uh, do this. The, the water system was separated from the Department of Sanitation. Um, they found fun, you know, he, he found funding for it. Um, it's a whole water and irrigation system with some, some mir uh, meters all the way through and some sections and things like that. But um, the water usage is, is, is great. And there are, certain, there are certain behaviors of some of the gardeners that definitely have to be uh, um, addressed, but it is pricey. The water is very expensive. Um, the seniors have been leaving. Um, it's becoming kind of a, you know, it's, it's expensive. So anyway, uh, can, you give, can you give a little more detail? I, I haven't toured. So that's another thing I guess I want to see. Okay. So if I had a, a patch and was growing food for my family, 
is it going from ten dollars a month to a hundred dollars a month or two hundred? I mean, if if you're if you're telling me it's raising one hundred fifty thousand, you know, I don't know how many gardeners you'd have there, but it sounds like if Jason I had a garden there, would be writing out checks for a thousand dollars a month. So, so you know, help help yeah, me. Yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, well, there. no, no, no. Yeah, currently, um, let's see. I just I just paid an annual fee. It's it's four hundred dollars for the year. Four hundred a year. Okay, well, that's yeah. still that's that's a you know reasonable amount. And, it's, and it's it's, but, but but yeah, just letting you know, it's still not meeting uh, what's what's being used. Um, not everybody has utilized their plot. When it finally gets to be um, to full use, it's going to be a different bill entirely. A lot of people, such as myself, I've never even used the water yet. Mm -hmm. So I've I paid you know I paid a portion of a year, and um, somebody else it was a contribution to somebody else's usage. So. Okay. Okay. So, they're not pumping. They're not getting gray water over there. No, no. It's that, and that's that's the other thing is, oh. is that those are some of the things that we had asked about. You know, can we get gray water? Can we do this? Can we do that? And and all of those solutions are things that what we're hoping is that that this garden, which also happens to be the oldest uh, community garden in all of Los Angeles and the entire city uh that yeah. that some solutions can be brought and it could be actually a star example of things like cisterns get being gotten rainwater um uh storage it, it the, the possibility of that is actually pretty great um and th there's a lot of a lot of different things anyway um oh, yeah. uh, uh measure w i believe it's measure Measure W. There's a there's a federal fund that uh, might be able to be utilized for this, and there's some things that the community gardeners are doing. So, so if they ever wanted to do a presentation here too, you know, please let me know. I'd love to yeah. them talk about what they're doing. You know, from an informational point of view, if they have a request for us to consider. Uh, this, yeah, just just this week, uh, Connie and um, and uh, uh, our local representative Amanda uh, came out. So uh, they toured it and took some of our concerns. And Connie, you know, of course, is into education and everything like that. So she was kind of like, yay, you know. <laughs> is this garden ever utilized by schools, by LAUSD schools? There, the idea is to, we, uh, one of the plots that's right next to me is intended for education. Okay. And okay. in fact, we were supposed to have a, a um, a, a training session in March, but it got rained out. There's going to be another one in May, but there are four four uh, garden practices thing. And we're also trying to create a relationship with the Department of Sanitation. Of course, they have their own. They have some classes down in the um, in that new park area where the bioswale is, right there by the by the freeway. There are some uh, gardening um, sessions going on there, mulching and and the rest of it. Um, uh, because the Department of Sanitation is right there, there's a lot of opportunity for for more of those. So mm -hmm. a lot of outreach, and um, uh, yeah, and and some teachers are part of the part of the garden specifically for that. Right. Okay. okay. Well, we'll keep following that, and uh, I think I've gotten through most of the items there. There's uh, I don't have a report from the Joint Environmental Sustainability Committee this month or from the. Uh, Port Neighborhood Council Chamber meeting. Uh, we've talked about the legislation. Um, any anything? Any other legislation other than the Senate bill? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And then motions. I put these under motions. That might be how I accidentally deleted something, Gwen. I thought I interpreted your email to say you might want to have a motion um, about uh, something to do with the Peck Park security system and vegetation, but but maybe I misunderstood that. So is there something you'd like to move for us to take action on that? Or is that more, have we already dis discussed it? Because you made a reference that um, Peck Park could maybe use additional security like locking gates to Western entrance to disallow parking activity like Royal Palms. I don't remember discussing that part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, let me let, let me just uh, say that. So so you know that uh, there's an ongoing volunteer effort to uh, put in native plants to start uh, getting those grasses out, you know, creating safety and um, on multiple levels by by uh, changing the plantings to low water uh, native plants. 
instead of the grasses. Uh, that helps. That helps actually a budget. You know, the, the the city budget is is helped with that. You know, we won't need goats if we put in native plants, or you know. But uh, uh, in regards to uh, and I'm still not making wait, where is it? Talk. Where where is that part? With I, I'm part? I'm under emotions under environmental sustainability. I I think I may be misinterpreted. I oh oh, oh let me go to the, sorry. I thought this would be something thing. we could ask for. It appeared to be something that was going to be yeah yeah yeah. So, before sorry. I was on the board, before COVID, that there was an issue in 2019 about additional security, like gates. right, right. Um, that was so. So the shooting brought all of these things up. Um, so over at Royal Palms, there was a shooting just recently, and in order to um, kind of help cool things down and ensure that people don't go there after hours. You know, most parks have those those big swinging gates that that do lock. Um, of course, Friendship Park has them. You know, you can't drive after a certain time; they get locked. It. I I think that it would be beneficial if Peck Park had a similar thing where where there's a a locking gate at some port at, at some location, um, just to help to discourage uh, people from hanging out over there. Uh, for example. Last, I don't know if they lock them, but they do have gates at all the parking entrances. I don't think that they lock them because um, I've seen I've seen groups like uh, last July Fourth when we had some of those fires. But you know that's a different thing. I I was actually driving by and there were a bunch of cars in the lot and some people were shooting off fireworks right there by the playground. You yeah. know, and it was going it's on July Fourth. They're going to have the park open. Yeah, July fourth. But Ben, Ben, maybe you can help me. This my close. recollection. It, it was around that time, and they were shooting off fireworks, and it was not. It was not. You know, it was people who decided they to. They have go gates and, and everything on on yes, the park does. down down the road from me, um, and it doesn't stop people from going in there or, or breaking yeah. locks or to get in. Well, with that, um, there, there's there's some other funding that uh, was supposed to come to Peck Park uh, for a project that has not yet been been provided. Um, it kind of vanished, and uh, so there were going to be some initial inquiries if that funding, you know, if, if that funding disappeared, um, or is it back on? You know, what so, is so that part going to be done? So, so I think, you know, Ben, you can probably support me. We played basketball there after hours. We've never seen it locked. We know Friendship Park would sometimes go to pick you up, and that one would be locked, oh, it's locked. on the dots, right? And yeah, yeah. Sometimes five minutes early, I'd get annoyed because they are very good at locking it. So, so I think we can establish that, you know, there are gates. The gates aren't being locked. Um, you know, this could be a – we could be in the purview of another um, committee as well. Um, and, and I'm sensitive to what Craig's saying because I've had people uh, – you know, almost threaten us walking through the woods that we're doing bad things and challenge them on. And mm -hmm. I didn't, can, you know, physically confront them, but they were lighting fires and doing things. And this was, you know, around the time where trees were being lit on fire. So, so I know it wouldn't stop everyone, but it could stop the car traffic, right? Because I, I've never been prohibited from, from going in there at any hour. So I don't know if that's something that this committee wants us to look into doing a, a recommendation or not, but, you know, we can, we can I, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, you know, so that means they'll park by your house. Yeah. They'll park on the street on Western yeah. instead of parking in the parking lot. I don't know if that's going to solve the problem. It'll just, um, it, it's a little bit of a discouragement. That's all. Um, the, the fire in Hernandez Ranch that actually happened on July 4th would never be discouraged because they, they parked right there in the community and walked in and, and just blasted it off and started a fire. But but it will discourage some uh, activity, you know. I, I did think we had a commitment, or I remember hearing we had a commitment at two meetings I went to. There'd be more police presence around there, more. And I have to say, I've not seen that. I, I haven't been monitoring carefully, but I don't get the sense in the last you know month or so that that commitment to the community has really been kept up. And I haven't seen a lot of bad things going on, but um, you know, I thought that was kind of the expectation after the shooting that there was going to be more attentive and. I think I'm agreeing with with Craig that I think that would be more of a turret, right? If there's somebody there that would stop somebody versus blocking it, but but I'm not, I'm not trying to say we can't go forward. I just want to see if there's consensus um, to work on a proposal for that idea. 
Um, anybody else want to comment, Mary or Jason or anybody in the community? How many attendees we have left? Uh, no, I guess they're gone. There are none. Well, I'm here, but I have to go now because it's past eight o'clock. Yeah, no, we are past eight. So, um, and so thank you for it. Yeah, we had, we had we don't have a community impact statement uh, for motions and it didn't look like we wanted to do any action on the goat vegetarian mi mitigation so um well well make that a, make that an agenda point um hopefully uh yeah can can support the senate bill um we can give it to our assembly member um and uh, uh said, i'll work on the survey monkey thing craig said he was going to write a letter about the goats Right, right. So, so Craig, oh, oh, and I gotta get that to you. Craig's gonna write a letter on the go. I gotta get that to you right now. And, um, and uh, you know, the vegetation also in your notes you shared that for people who are curious, they haven't done any mitigation of the Peck Park vegetation now because of the rains, right? It'd be kind of a, a waste, is what what your official response was. And they have budget to do it twice. So once the rains are deemed to have stopped, mm -hmm. um, because because if you have walked around there, the it's it's the highest I've seen. It's uh, tremendous it's, it's pretty it's, high it's taller than me in places along it's, the trail. yeah it's and it's on the trail yeah i mean it, it's oh, so overgrown all the way through peck park i'm very concerned and i'm hoping that they'll get a jump on it because the contractor that's a very big park i i hiked the whole thing and mm -hmm. the vegetation this year you know the 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 year that it, it was may when when that fire happened correct uh yeah if, if there was a fire with with this length it would be quite quite a blaze i imagine so i, I not, think we yeah. think we've heard that they're planning to do it as soon as possible we just don't have a date so hopefully we'll have a date or um by our next meeting Any, anybody else have anything? i i think we would we would want to get get and maybe get on the issues committee about this year it's going to be a huge problem with uh, overgrown vegetation coming Huge. summer because I'm looking at the field across the street from me. Yeah, yeah it cut it all down and it's now, you know, three feet high. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, this is going to be an issue this year. And I, I'm always afraid with the fireworks that goes off. Yeah, um, well, it, it, it can't. On, it can. on a separate, on a separate issue on the the letter about the goats um are we going to are we going to vote it out of committee or um am i just going to write it and we present it to the board not coming in out of committee what's the urgency i i'm indifferent if we want to run it through our next meeting if you want us to have a special meeting or you know, I, I'll take no offense if you go right to the, the stakeholder meeting. Let me, but. let me take a look at the calendar right now. I, I'm about to send it to you, Craig. I maybe, you know, I can send all of you guys a link. I'll, I'll just hold on. Let me see where we are. Uh, history. It's very, very early on. It's been referred to committee. And so it's, it's very early in the process. We do have some time. So this could mm -hmm. wait until next time. Okay, so is that so? Okay. So I'll write the letter and submit it to the committee. Okay, okay. Thank, no thank you. And if somehow we're delayed, you know, I, I'm happy to support. It. I've seen people bring things up through for that other way, or all kinds of creative ways things get there. So, um, but I, I I don't see anybody opposed to us trying to to speak on that, and, and really appreciate your willingness to do the letter. Okay, any other items of business? Otherwise, we are past our you know time approximate to end. I want to thank everyone for their attendance. This was really robust attendance. Um, I, th I thought our newest member had to come to make quorum, but you know, you had to come anyway because you're obliged to do a good job, Mr. Norman. Mm -hmm. But um, that's all I have. So I'll call this meeting adjourned. Stop the recording. Thank you. <laughs>